All right. Now let's uh, continue with this discussion of this, uh, of the underpinnings of this of these uh, this type of big data science. So this is just a reminder of what we already discussed. It has some additional information, like 3,600 people are in uh, are in CMS, and they come from 183 different organizations and from 38 countries. So this clearly demonstrates the need for the work collaboratively in the slogan for this course. And this also points out what I already mentioned. It cost half a billion dollars just to build each of those experiments. Atlas is essentially the same size as, it says there are only 3,000. I'm not certain how accurate these numbers are. Um, here are the actual seven different experiments. Uh, we saw on that on the picture earlier, Atlas, uh, Alice, CMS, LHCB. The other ones we did not see. There are smaller experiments. Notice this is a European Union experiment, but it has a collaboration with the uh, United States and probably other countries as well. But the fundamental management and funding that went into this came from the European Union. Of course, the US had a, a machine of this class, the so-called SSC, it was in uh, Dallas, Texas, and that was closed down in some um, um, political slash scientific events where at some critical time the support of the field or the support of scientists broadly was not enough to preserve the um, SSC, so actually they were gone quite a long way in constructing it before it was just terminated. And then CERN, the European Union has one feature that's interesting. Once you get something started, it's not so easy to turn it off because all the uh, countries are collaborating. And uh, if one country decides to pull out, the other countries can stop that happening because they'll have various uh, other implications for the whole European Union. So the EU. The process puts on some stability into projects in, the, in, the, in Europe. Uh, so here are the budgets of um, which are, um, if you go to the Department of Energy, I mean there's some National Science Foundation funding going into LHC, but most of it comes from DOE. DOE also does a lot of other things. Uh, uh, with experiments and theory of, of particle physics, and that's uh, seven, seven, almost eight hundred million a year. I do not know how much the LAC is there, but it will be a non trivial amount. And uh, if you just look at what it takes to fund all these people, 6,000 people, that's where I sort of estimated half a billion a dollar, half a billion dollar a year, a year across all the countries. Here's a striking feature of the uh, of this field, and that's the papers. If you look at this, um, I pointed out there are 3,000 people on these experiments. So here are the th beginning of the 3,000 people. We only we have AAD as the first person, and on this particular slide we get the BAU. So we're only we only got uh, partially through the Bs. This page is mainly A's. So it's not surprising when we get through the Z's to the to the, uh, the to the participants beginning with Z, which presumably largely come from China. Uh, we have many pages of this particular publication correspond to the people. Probably more pages in the people than there are in the physics, and um, that is, as I mentioned, one of the reasons I gave up was when I did. Uh, Experiments in this field, there were 30 people on an experiment. Now we have 3,000 or 3,500. I also found uh, being a not terribly uh, uh, relaxed person that uh, I found working with those 30 people. They were all very talented and committed. Working with 30 people is not trivial. Uh, at least in the days when I did it, it wasn't trivial. Nowadays, they're better tools and it's better understood. But the concept that then I could already see that the experiments are getting high, larger in size, and so I was a little worried and uh, switched to the uh, smaller size collaborations and uh, quicker moving fields that happened in computing research. 
here is the um, a sort of uh, this is again comes from my past. Uh, this is, well, this is not from my past, but it's the type of things I used to do. This gives this is a picture, a so-called Feynman diagram, telling you what happens when a proton and an antiproton collide. Uh, gluons are produced. Gluons are the particles that bind everything, the quarks together to incite these protons and antiprotons. They have a so-called Bushel interaction. Which uh, with a heavy particle, the heavy particle couples to this Higgs boson, which is then produced. The Higgs boson uh, cannot survive forever; it always decays, and the decay is. To, there are actually several um, final states that decays to. We saw the data from the two-photon decay. This is a gamma zero is a photon. Another possible decay is to lots of leptons. These are electrons and muons and Tau's, the uh, lepton family. And these are the diagrams which you estimate when you want to try to understand what the Higgs might look like and design the apparatus. And to look and see what's the most plausible things to do. As you would look, study these so-called Feynman diagrams, you would estimate their size, which might be a little unreliable. But something is probably reasonably reliable is what the final states would look like. The constraints of spins and symmetries will tell you what these two photons, uh, the distribution in, in uh, angular angular distribution, the momentum distribution for a given Higgs mass, you would be able to estimate that pretty reliably for these types of decays. And those would, that's actually with the type of thing I used to do. I used to do phenomenology, which is building models. Uh, I should point out the physics, although there's a fundamental theory, that theory is impossible to calculate what happens when the proton and antiproton collide at very high energy. Uh, you can, you have some good idea of roughly what's going to happen, but in detail you have no idea, and you have to build models, and that's building models of what happens when uh, this type of thing, uh, when these types of collisions are made, is the type of thing I used to do as my physics research in those days many years ago. And I say, that's still the, the same, much more sophisticated versions of what I, what I used to do. And now at the heart of the so-called Monte Carlo analysis and the planning of these experiments, you notice how big those apparatus were. One feature of them being big is they're very complicated and you're not quite certain how they behave. And the way you understand how they behave is you make a model for the, uh, you not only make a model for how the Higgs boson is produced, you make a model for the um, apparatus and you produce so-called Monte Carlo events, which you run through exactly the same software that uh, you use to run or analyze the real events. So that's a huge positive. If you take events which have Higgs particles in them and you generate them by the Monte Carlo, and then you run them through the science and that the actual same software you use to run real events. You can A, convince yourself you would have seen it, and also you estimate the so-called efficiency, the probability uh, if you observe a certain number of Higgs boson events, uh, the probability that you uh, have a fraction of the actual Higgs boson events you saw. So that's. Um, that's how these innocent looking pretty pictures are used. And uh, now we go on for the, the rest of this um, unit into a discussion of some pictures illustrating big science. And then we finally get back into the uh, uh, next unit. We will actually go into the actual statistical analysis of what's going on. Uh, thank you very much. This is Jeffrey Fox finishing uh, the fir this uh, second lesson of the first unit on physics informatics and the discovery of the Higgs boson. Thank you very much.